All right, this Tuesday is the Major League All-Star Game, and um, I don't know how many Tigers are going to be in the All-Star Game this year. However, if you're a big Tigers fan, you can remember back in the 80s when they had players like uh, Lou Whitaker and uh, Kirk Gibson and Alan Trammell and some of the greats when they won the uh, you know, World Series. And uh, that's how you grew up. However, I grew up in the 70s, and I was around Cincinnati, and we had Pete Rose and Johnny Bench and Joe Morgan and some of those guys, and we won the World Series a few times. As a matter of fact, there was one all-star game where the Reds had players on first, second, short, third, and home plate all at the same time. Uh, just an amazing team. And if you grew up as a kid um, playing baseball, you had heroes. And what I would do is I would try to mimic those guys. And uh, every one of the Reds had a different stance on how they would hold the bat. And uh, depending on who your favorite player was is how you, how you held the bat. I don't know if you guys ever did that. But Pete Rose was a switch hitter. And uh, maybe next to Mickey Mantle, one of the greatest. And he would crouch back like this, and he would hold his hat back. Uh, Joe Morgan caught right-handed, but he batted left-handed. And if, if you remember this, if you're not a Reds fan, you don't know, he would hold his bat like this, and then right before the pitch came, he would twitch his left hand. And then he would hit the ball. One of the best second basemen ever. Uh, Johnny Bench would just slug the ball. And then uh, my favorite was Tony Perez. That was my favorite guy. And he would actually hold his bat down here. And he would hold it down here, and then he would swing from there. And um, so we would, we would mimic them, hoping that we could hit like them. However, we didn't. Um, we, we, you know, you, you, you can only mimic so far. But that, I think that's what we end up doing. When, when we want to do something, we watch somebody, and we learn how they do it. Today we call it mentoring. It's apprenticeship. We learn a lot from our parents. We learn a lot from the people that we work with. We can look back, and a lot of who we are and why we do things and how we do things, and even our mannerisms, we could probably attribute it back to somebody in our life that we patterned ourselves after. Well, we're looking at this whole idea of the grace of giving that, that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And at the very beginning, the first four verses, he's telling the Corinthians kind of to, to put the Macedonian churches into their pattern. Learn how to give like them. And the way they gave was they gave in spite of their circumstances. We learned that they were a very, very poor church. They were a very persecuted church. And that and yet they gave joyfully and they gave abundantly. As a matter of fact, he says they gave way more than they should have given. And he just said, you know, that's, that's the way you can give. Well, we're going to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and we're going to discover another way that we can give. And that's actually using a better pattern, a better model. And that is to give like Jesus. Give like Jesus gave. And so if you want to turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're going to just pick it up in the next few verses after from last week. If you weren't here last week, um, that's okay because we're just going to pick it right up and learn how to give like Jesus. How to give like Jesus. It was Jesus who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And as a matter of fact, it's not mentioned, that quote is not mentioned in any of the Gospels. It's actually mentioned by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. Paul's the one that pulled it out and wrote it, and had it not been for him, we wouldn't have that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we're looking at some of the blessings of giving and giving like Jesus. And so if you want to look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, begin reading in verse 5. We're going to read all the way down to verse 9. It says, and it's kind of carrying on with the Macedonian church, he said, and this they did. Not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others to prove the sincerity of your love, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, ye, 
yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Isn't that a beautiful verse? We'll read that again. It says, uh, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. We're going to learn how to give like Jesus. The, Macedon- the Macedonians gave like Jesus. In other words, they, they, their, their pattern, and, and actually Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, and that's how we should do. We sometimes have human patterns. We sometimes learn how to do things by somebody else, but hopefully, eventually, we're learning how to become more and more and more like Jesus. That's really the motto of our church, to follow Jesus and lead more people to follow Jesus. That's what we want to do. So the first thing I noticed here that he did, and this is kind of a, uh, what the Macedonians did, is that give yourself first to God. That's what they did. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus gave himself to God. It says here in this passage that they didn't give like we hoped. In other words, they gave way above. They, they first gave themselves before they ever gave their money, before they ever gave their time. They gave all of themselves to God. And that's how Jesus gave. If you have your Bible open to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, if you look back a few pages, or not back, forward a few pages in the book of Galatians, which is the very next book. In the book of Galatians, you'll notice in verse chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, talking about Jesus, it says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. It says, he gave himself. He presented himself. And actually, in the next, ver- next chapter, Galatians 2, verse 20, which is one of my favorite verses, 2.20 says, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, and this is what I want you to notice, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus offered everything he had. He first gave himself to God. We find in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gave himself again to God. He presented himself to his Father to do whatever you want to do with me, even if it means dying on a cross. Jesus said, not my will, your be done, your will be done. I'd rather bypass this, but I want to do what you you want me to do. That's what the Macedonians did. Before they ever gave anything at all, they made sure that they gave themselves to God. That's, first of all, salvation. To receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior. That is giving everything you have. Surrendering yourself to Him and saying, Lord, I'm yours. But for those of us that are believers, it actually goes a little bit beyond that. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans He deals with the whole idea of salvation. And he gets into chapter 12 and he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, he talks about that we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. God, here I am. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll give whatever you want me to do. I am all yours. Because here's what what happens. Is when you give everything you have to God, that includes your calendar. That includes your bank account. That includes not just Sunday. That includes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That not only includes what you do for God. That includes everything you do for everybody else. Everything I have belongs to him. There's no secular and sacred. There's no, oh, I can't tell this joke in church. I'll wait and tell it in the parking lot. It is, I am all in for God. Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect. That definitely doesn't mean that because we'd all be discluded. Discluded? Is that a right word? Disqualified. I invented a new word. Discluded. That's what happens when your brain goes faster than your mouth, or your mouth goes faster than your brain. Which I'm not doing very good with either one, am I? (laughs) But you know what? But I'm all in. And and here's here's the danger. Okay? Here's really a good lesson that we can learn from this. And that is. If you haven't given yourself to God, your money doesn't do much. God is not interested in your money. We'll talk about this in a minute. He's interested in you. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure, because here's here's what happens. If if we don't give ourselves to God, we we discover that, you know what, maybe, maybe 
um, I'm giving my money and that's okay with God. I hear this. Jesus could have our money without our heart, but he cannot have our heart without our money. When we give all we have to God, when we give him what we have, that's, that's enough. And then if he, if he has our heart, if he has us, if he has me, he has what I have. So this is what I encourage you to do. Give yourself to God. Say, God, here I am. No holds barred. Whatever you want is fine. I'm all in. The second thing I discover here, and that's as, as we continue on, is um, you need to give from a heart of love. Give from a heart of love. In verse 8, well, actually, back in verse 7, he says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, talking about growing, abounding, growing. They, they were growing in a lot of things. And Paul says, I want you to grow in this grace also. I want you to grow in giving. And isn't it interesting is I, I want to grow in my prayer life. I don't know if you do. I do. I want to grow in my Bible knowledge and understanding. I want to know more about the Bible. I want to I be better at sharing my faith with people. Wherever I'm at, I want to I expand in that. But sometimes in the area of giving, we stop. We stop and say, okay, I'm just going to give this much and then I'm done. Paul says, no, I want you to abound. I want you to continue to grow because I want it. He says in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by the occasion of, threat, occasion of others. Prove the sincerity of your love. I want you to give out out of a heart of love. I want you to love God. And I want you to give not because you feel a duty to it. Or not because you feel an obligation. Or not because you feel guilty that you don't. Those are, those are m good motivators, but they're poor motivators. Paul says, I want you to give because you love God. Give out of a heart of love. You know, when, when we give gifts, we may give a little bit out of guilt. We may give a little bit out of duty, but it would be foolish for us to admit it to our spouse, wouldn't it? You know, it's for their birthday anniversary, and we got a gift. I say, oh, I love it, I love it. Yeah, it's your birthday, so I felt like I needed to do this. <laughs> that doesn't go over very well, does it, you know? Or, yeah, I knew, you know, I'd feel guilty if I didn't do it, so, you know, I feel really bad. Or have you, have you ever gone to an event and somebody gave you a gift, like a, like and, and you didn't get them a gift, and all of a sudden you feel guilty, and then you go after it's over, and you buy them a gift and give them a gift back. To, not, not out of anything, but just do you feel guilty that they gave you something and you didn't give them back. Paul says, no, I want, you, I want this to be a representation of how much you love them, of how much you love God, of how much you love other people. And that's the way Jesus gave. That's how he gave. For, for God so loved the world. God the Father, God the Son, God loved us. But uh, Romans chapter 5. But God commendeth his love toward us. He, his love toward us. Jesus loved us. And that's why he gave himself for us. That's why he died on the cross. Is for the love that he had for us. And that should be why we want to give. Is just basically out of, a, out of a heart of love. And so I have this little little saying. I thought it was kind of good. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving if you really love somebody you're going to give them your time if you really love somebody you're going to give them a gift and you can you can give somebody something and not really love them can't you you can buy it you can give it to them and you can really care less about them i give money all the time to the irs <laughs> amen do you love them uh, not exactly okay Okay, no, you can give stuff to people, you know, you can see somebody on the side of the road and you can give them some, you know, a couple of bucks or, you know, leftover McDonald's bag or something like that. And, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of compassion, and I would say that, but, you know, when you really love somebody, you, you want to give them. And it, it, I'd, I'd like to give more. I would like to give more to my family. I'd like to give more to God. It, and it, it's, it's the heart that's important. It's not... It is not as much the amount, it's the, the heart that is there. But the ex ex extreme way 
that Jesus gives is he gives sacrificially. He gives sacrificially. And that's where we find out here in chapter ni- or verse 9. He says, you know the grace. And that, that's interesting, that word grace, it's also the word gift. It can be interchanged at different times the way Paul decides to use it. Grace is a gift. And, and, a, and a true gift is out of grace. A true gift is not to be deserved. It's to be given as a, an appreciation or a, or a love. It's a, it's a gift. And so he uses, uses this. We know the gift of God. We know the grace of God. And he says that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. This is an interesting take. Is he uses two examples of giving. And, and don't, don't miss this. The Macedonians were dirt, begging, poor, had absolutely nothing. But he says in the first few verses, he said they gave way above what they could afford to give. In other words, they were poor, but they gave like they were rich. And Jesus was unbelievably rich. Not as much in money as in who he was and what he was. And yet he became poor so that he could actually give out of his riches. And the terminology and the way the Greek is used, it refers back to um, his incarnation. When, When Jesus stepped down from heaven, where he was in the bosom of his father, where he was in the love of his father, he stepped down from heaven and became a human being so that he could die on a cross. It's in Philippians chapter 2 that talks about what I would just consider the dissension of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, I just want to read it to you because it's, it's just beautiful. And, and actually, it's, it's kind of like a poem. And it, it goes along and it is actually an explanation of Paul telling us that we need to have this same attitude like Jesus had. In Philippians chapter 2, verse, verse uh, 5, he says, Let this mind, or really let this attitude, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He did it out of love, but he gave everything up. He, he did not cease to be God, but he gave up the privilege of being God. He became not like us, although he became human, he became less. He became a servant. And he became a slave. And he a cruel death that none of us would ever die. And not just death, the death of a criminal. He, he was so high and went so low, gave up so much for us. And then he says, and because of that, I love that I can't stop there because this ends up in the, you know, in the tomb. It says in verse 9, wherefore, because Jesus stepped down so far, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Macedonians were so poor, they had nothing, but they still gave so much. And, and, and they did it out of joy, and they did it so generously. And Jesus was so rich, he had so much, and he gave it all up so that he, out of his poverty, could give us his riches. And so whatever our excuse is, whether we don't have anything whether we have something, both of these examples knock it both out. It's because we should have such love for God that we are willing to give. And this is, I I just want to remind you, this is not normal church giving. This isn't faithful weekly giving to your church or your tithe or your missions. This this was a special kind of a one-time offering that was given to the poor people in uh, the, the Jerusalem church. But this is how 
our giving of any kind should be. We, we should want to give because we have given God everything we have. And so it should be easy when God asks us to give something special on an occasion, we should say, okay, God, you know, you've been good, so good to me. Um, I, I've given all, all I have. If you want this, I'll, I'll give it to you. We should give out of a heart of love. He loved us and I love him. And you know what? I give to, pe- I give to people I love. I'll give, every, I'll give everything I have because of somebody I love. And I give sacrificially. Jesus sacrificed everything for me. I'm willing to sacrifice whatever he asked for me. That, that's, that's really how Jesus gave. And, and I, I kind of, because I'm always hesitant when I talk about money at church. I don't want people to think it, that I'm talking about finances. Because this isn't about finances. I, I, I mentioned it last week. Not one time in chapter 8 and chapter 9 does Paul talk about money. It's because it, it isn't our money that God is after. It's our heart. But he knows that our heart is attached to our money. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. So he doesn't want it, but he knows that if we give our finances, he'll get our heart. And if he has our heart, we'll give our money. And that's why our giving is a representation of how much we love. My favorite story about giving is Skittles. And some of you have probably heard this story before. It is not new. I heard it from somebody else. I heard it from a guy. So if you got your Skittles, hang on to them. If you already ate your Skittles, good. All right? That's what I gave them to you for. So eat them or give them to somebody. Share. I don't care. Um, I just gave them as as an illustration for you to have so you can think about it. If you didn't get Skittles, pick them up on the way out. Okay? I got a whole bag of them bunch of bags of them. I've got little bags. I didn't want to give anybody big bags. Okay, I've got little bags. There was a grandpa, and, um, and he was with his grandkids. Oh, let me give you the point. Here, let me give you the point for this one. Um, sacrifice is giving up something that matters for something that matters more. Isn't that good? I didn't come up with that one either. The good ones I don't come up with. See? Sacrifice is giving up something that matters. You know, if, if God asked us to give up something that we were going to throw away anyway, it doesn't matter, does it? But if he asked for us to give up something that we really care about, that would hurt. You know why? Because it matters more. So anyway, back to the Skittles. Grandpa had his grandkids, and so he decided he would ba- buy a bag of Skittles for his grandson. So, um, so he bought a bag of Skittles. So for fun, he just went up to him and says, hey, hey, hey. Can you give me a uh, Skittle? Grandson said, nope, they're mine. And Grandpa just said, you know, you just think, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he said, he thought, number one, I gave him the Skittles. Had I not given him the Skittles, he wouldn't have them in the first place. Just out of thankfulness, just out of gratitude, he should give me a Skittle. Number two, I'm bigger than this little kid is. If I wanted the Skittles, I could just grab them from him and take them from him. And number three, I got a credit card. If I want to, I can buy him a hundred bags of Skittles. So he should be nice to me because I can give him all the Skittles he wants until he's sick of Skittles. And his grandpa began to think that that's exactly what God, you know, Everything we have to God is a gift. Our life, our family, our job, our health, our time, everything. Some things we have, people would love to have like what we have. So every now and then, God asks us to give him something. Or God asks us to give what we have, a part of what we have, to somebody else. A little video, we see somebody on the street and there's a tug on our heart. That doesn't happen all the time. But every now and then, it's like, what are you going to do with what I gave you? Well, number one, we should. We should be a giver. Because God gave it to us in the first place. And he's bigger than us. If he wanted to take it, he could take it. And I think sometimes God does. I think sometimes when we're not generous, we lose it. You don't use it, you lose it. And the other thing is, God has a whole lot more that he wants to give us. 
And he can't give us when we already feel like we have our hands full. It's only when we give it away that our hands become empty and all of a sudden then God could fill us. So I don't want you, I don't want you to think that this, this whole idea of giving our time and giving our finances and giving our talents and giving our abilities to the Lord is in any way, in any way a sacrifice. It actually means that we're giving away something that is really important, but it's that God wants to fill it with something even more. God will never ask us to give him something, or God will never take away something that he doesn't have something even better to take its place. It's a grace. So I encourage you to give to God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I just want you to think about that, about the grace of giving. God is a giving God. He gave it all up for us. He is a giving God. And he wants his children to be givers. And maybe you're having a struggle with that, believer, right now. Maybe God wants you to give him who you are. Maybe there's an aspect of your life that you haven't given it to God. Maybe you haven't really given God everything. You've given him bits and pieces of your life. But you haven't gotten desperate enough to give him those corner pieces of your life. I just encourage you to just give yourself to God. Just let it go. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I just encourage you to give your life to him. Surrender yourself. Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of your sins. And if you will trust Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive you of your sin and be your Lord and Savior, surrender your life. He will save your soul, forgive you of your sin, and bring you into his family. I encourage you to do that. In a few minutes, Barb's going to play through a song, and I'd just like to encourage you to just talk to God about it. If you want to come up here, I'll be down here in the front and pray with you, talk with you a little bit if you want. If you just want to spend a little bit of time, you're more than welcome to, just to make this connection with God. That's why we're here on Sunday morning. It's not just to sing a bunch of songs and hear somebody talk for about 20, 30 minutes and then leave and get our Christian duty out. We came to meet God. And if you leave and you have not done that, you've missed the whole purpose. So right now, make your connection with God and do what he wants you to do. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are way more willing to meet with us than we are with you. Father, I'm sure for many of us, it was a struggle just to be here today. Something inside of us wanted to and something inside of us wanted to stay home or go somewhere else. And right now we're having that same struggle. There's a struggle that we want to get up and leave and go on and do about the rest of the day. And there's another struggle inside of us that we need to meet with you. Help us to fight the urge to move away from you and to cling to the urge, your spirit to move closer to you. Whatever it takes, Lord, help us to move closer to you, closer to your son, to listen to the Holy Spirit and do our business with you. May we give ourselves to you because then everything else will be a lot easier to give to you if you ask it. Pray that you'd help people make the right decisions today. We pray this in Jesus' name.